<laughs> no. I wanted to apologize to Jay because we did have plans to have this tour in Tabor so he could have showed off his beautiful plots well taken care of. Um, we had some challenges things with the tour, through. so things fell through on our end of it. It's so. all good, but anyways, appreciate you coming out here too. Maybe I'll take this chance just briefly to introduce um, another that was supposed to be a partner in today's event. And the Tabor area has gotten together some local businessmen and local farmers, and they're starting this organization like a vocational college called the Polaire Institute. And the whole theory behind what they're doing is trying to create an opportunity that's focused on uh, the irrigated crop sector, the high value uh, agriculture that's going on, and training, uh, appropriately training a workforce to be able to meet the demands there. So it's one of those ones where it's difficult, it doesn't really fit our, our typical college system because there's, you know, ESL is often a challenge for those workers, and, and they want to be able to, to come up and be able to work on sugar beets and, and potatoes and irrigation pivots and that sort of stuff. So. They're, they're, they've been a great partner to work with. They've negotiated uh, a chunk of land with the town of Tabor. So we're going to try to partner with them as well to be more of the research component, to bring in sort of guest speakers from various parts of the world. And, and together, hopefully, just sort of build a little bit of capacity for that high value irrigation sector. So um, with that, I will pass it off to Jay. Thanks, Jay. Yeah. I just want to skip this clicker. We'll advance my slides. No, that's okay. Okay, as, uh, as Ken mentioned, my name is Jay Anderson. I'm a research agronomist with Roger Sugar. Um, I've been there for, I think this is my seventh season. Um, so I'll maybe just, uh, I don't have a slide on this, but I maybe, I maybe should have put one in there, but just to explain sort of kind of what, what our research program is. Uh, so there's I like to joke that there's two sugar beet research agronomists in Canada, and I'm one of them. The other one is Peter Rogetnik. And uh, so we do sugar beet research in Tabor. They used to have a factory in Winnipeg, but uh, that closed down a number of years ago. And so there are some, some sugar beets grown in, in Ontario, but they pull those down into Michigan for Michigan sugar. So we're, uh, and so we, and Tabor is the only facility turning sugar beets into sugar in Canada. Anyway, so our research program is partially funded by the ASBG, and, and, and then so it's about 50-50 split between Atlantic and ASBG. We have a joint company grower committee, research committee that oversees our program, and that committee approves varieties commercially uh, that will be commercially grown in the Tabor area and the surrounding area for processing. So that, that committee works to approve those varieties for commercial growth. Um, the varieties, the main focus of our program is variety testing. We get, we get uh, paid to grow varieties from three different seed companies down in the U.S. And that funds the majority of our, our research program that way. Um, and so they, the varieties have to, they, we, we test the varieties and they have to meet a certain criteria. And then those varieties can be, can be grown commercially based on their approval. Um, the, the presentation that I'm going to give today um, we didn't get to these, these projects um, without a foundation of many other nitrogen-based fertility projects. The majority of our other research is mostly is, is fertility work with nitrogen. We've done, Peter has done a lot of work with nitrogen over the years, and um, this is kind of where we are right now, some of these maybe higher end or advanced. Uh, nitrogen type tests that I'll discuss today. Um, I think that's probably all I want to say about the, the research program. Uh, yeah. So just to maybe explain a little bit. Oh, is that going to work? What's going on here? There we go. This is going to be tricky without, you don't have a slide advancer, hey? That I can click? I should have brought one. I, I was hoping so. the mouse would work, but... I was hoping the mouse would work, but oh, maybe I need to turn this on. Because that's going to be tricky if I have to. Sorry about this. Do you, do you want me to press the button for you, Dave? No. Oh, it's, just okay. gonna, it's just going to kind of get annoying if I have to push that for every one of these. Um, 
So nitrogen is the most important element supplied to the sugar beet crop. Very few soils, we all know this. Oh man, what's going to happen here? <laughs> this isn't going to work, I should have tested this before. Um, so I made slideshow mode. Why isn't it? Yeah, maybe it sat for too long, I don't know. Slideshow and see how big they are. You might be able to just go down with um, page down. Your, your oh, is it down? Yeah. Okay. Some minor technical difficulties. Yeah, I still have some chokes out there. It takes a master's degree to figure out. Okay. Most important element supplied. Very few soils contain sufficient available form, and that doesn't include sub that includes at all the growing regions. Like we, um, sugar beets are grown globally, and so that statement is true for the global, the global market. <coughs> Deficient soils can reduce root yield by up to half. I've seen plots where we don't add any nitrogen, and you see a significant reduction in root root yield on those. They, those plots they look terrible. So nitrogen is a very important nutrient. It drives canopy color and leaf or and vigor in the early season. And you can definitely see a difference between plots that have had nitrogen and not. I think um, my my supervisor for my master's degree said the definition of an agronomist is someone who's continually amazed by the response of crops to nitrogen, and sugar beet is no exception to that. You can really tell when when there's uh, deficient deficiencies. And as, as we learned earlier today, um, the, the the plant available for the plant available forms are that we're talking about are nitrogen or nitrate and ammonium. So historically, lots of research has focused on optimizing root yield and quality in sugar beet. Excessive amounts of um, nitrogen will drive yield but crash quality. So we need to balance these. We've seen that we can push nitrogen yield and tops with, uh, with nitrogen, but then quality is in the tank. And so there's a fine line or a balance there. So it increases leaf, petiole, and root dry matter. And then um, those, those components of the plant can capture sunlight and produce sugar and store it in the root. So more dry matter above ground equals more light interception. Oh, nice. No, you can. Oh no, no, you can pull that if you want. There you go. It's all laser. Nice. Okay. So our current recommendation in Alberta is 180 to 220 pounds of N per acre. That's soil plus applied. Um, we find in most cases that it is somewhere in between there. The guys that have that are beet, we call them beet king, the most yield in sugar production out of any other grower in southern Alberta will generally have uh, a balance in there somewhere. Our, we've learned over the years that the crop can't tolerate a full broadcast application of nitrogen, that, so that 180 to 200 pounds, uh, 220. You'll have some in the soil, so you're not going to want to put that much in there, but a guy might put on 160 pounds or 150 pounds, and it's a really bad idea to put that in very close to planting. Uh, the seedlings just can't handle that. They get uh, you, You'll see significant stand loss in situations where too much nitrogen is, is applied too close to planting. Um, so the solution to that is time. And then we've also done tests at the demo farm and in other uh, area, places where we found that we can safen nitrogen applications using 
irrigation water or rain. It, it safens that application significantly. Um, a study that we did recently found we can safen up to 200 pounds even, and we don't recommend this to growers, like maybe one out of four, maybe two out of four years we've seen that a 200 pound application of nitrogen close to planting can be safened with an inch or 25 mils of either irrigation or, or rain fed. Um, and what we would consider to be safe is about 50 to 75 pounds close to planting would, yeah, would be considered safe. We wouldn't recommend generally anything more than that close to planting. Most of our producers, um, I think I can actually get to that in the next slide. So yeah, okay. So the Alberta approach, um, generally what happens is we'll do like a fall, guys will do a fall um, soil test. We like to encourage down to the four foot depth, but uh, some only do two, and that's okay too. It's better than nothing. Guys will apply in fall and um, and let that sit, but they won't apply that full complement. They'll leave some room in the soil with based on that 180 to 200 pound recommendation. Uh, they'll leave some room for top off, depending on what happens in, in spring, and I'll explain that a little bit later. So that's one method is fall, fall soil test uh, sampling and then applying before snowfall. The other option would be doing that in the spring, testing in the spring. I was at a conference recently that said, um, and, and I think we all know that this, but uh, applying or sorry, um, soil testing in spring is going to give you a much better idea of what's actually there when temperatures come up and when and whatever has happened during the winter has happened and it's in the past and uh, you know seeing what's in there close close to the planting and then applying in spring, but. It doesn't, it doesn't always work like that with field conditions and weather and stuff, right? So we have to be careful on that. So the fall seems to be kind of what is more commonly practiced. The other option is um, urea broadcasting crop when the crop is a little bit more advanced stage development and then irrigating it in or waiting for some rain. So there's a urea application of that or some guys use ammonium sulfate as well and like to use that better to sort of top things up. As I mentioned, you might not want to put that full complement in in the fall. Uh, might be a better idea to, to hold back a little bit and then see what your stand does in the spring and then uh, potentially put some on in crop. Another option, uh, not you would do this the full complement, but just other than like the, the granular applied, you would another option would be the UAN uh, through the through the pivot at time of germination or emergence to give so that little boost in, in the bigger. And then, oh, uh, yeah, so, that, so then the other option too is if you've done a little bit of this and there's done a little bit of this and there's still room, we recommend the latest you want to go on with, any, with UAN would be late July uh, if you want to see that <coughs> result in, at, at time of harvest in your, uh, in your Terra Lab analysis. Um, I guess maybe what I should explain there is Growers used to get paid on tonnage, and so they would uh, bring in a great big huge beat with lots of water, and then the, the, the quality would be uh, in the toilet. And so I think they've, they've come up with something over the last, um, I'm not sure when this came up, maybe, maybe um, in the last 20 years or more, where they're paid on tonnage and quality. So we want to try and, um, we want to try and have the quality at, a, at the optimal level and adding nitrogen too late in season can really affect that. So you want the timing to be to be good. So this UAN application, so are you basing that just on a general, let's do 20 pounds this time and 20 pounds this time, or are you basing it on your soil sample or the tissue sample? Um, not very many people do the tissue sample. There's a couple that are doing that, but you're basing it on a soil. Most guys, uh, they'll, they'll base it on a soil test they've done already yeah. in the past. Not necessarily. The more progressive ones might do like an in-season one, right, and follow that and see where things are. But if you if you ha if you know you have 50 in the soil in the fall and you put 100 on, well, you kind of think, well, um, yeah, there's maybe room for another 50 or something. So you could do 20, two 20 pound applications, like maybe at time of emergence, and then again later in the season. And we, we base that too sometimes on canopy color. Like if you're starting to yellow a little bit too early, then guys might put, put that on if they're planning to harvest uh, in October. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, this is the only data that I'm going to show. I've got three slides. I didn't want to show any data in this, though I am going to talk about three 
projects that we've been working on, uh, just to kind of show what happened. So um, along the horizontal axis, we did a treatment, or we did an experiment in 2017 and 2018, testing spring applied nitrogen rates. And along the bottom, so we used ESN this, in this test for both years. Along the bottom, pounds per acre of nitrogen, or ESN, yeah, so that's actual. These numbers are actual in, not product. So uh, the untreated check, and then on the, sorry, and then on the vertical axis, extractable sugar per acre, and I'm gonna use that term throughout this presentation. Extractable sugar per acre is kind of something that um, it makes sense from a grower's perspective to have high extractable sugar per acre. Um, and then I'll explain in another slide about extractable sugar per ton. So and that's in tons per acre produced. So you can see what happens with increasing rates of nitrogen up to 50. And I don't have the soil test results on this, but you get the idea that um, at a point, this is kind of a extractable sugar per acre is kind of a hybrid between tonnage and quality. Quality would be percent sugar or extractable sugar per, per ton. So this is kind of a hybrid between the two. Uh, but you see what happens at 200, you're, you're going down. And I'm not going to talk about significance or anything like that. that. This is just averages, but you can kind of see that trend of what happens with higher levels. So we want to kind of keep things, you know, lower on the lower end, more conservative. Pushing N too high is, is, can be detrimental. Extractable sugar per ton, um, this is something that the, the company likes to focus on, kilograms per ton of sugar produced. Again, along the bottom we have our nitrogen rates, and you can see again about that 50 pound range is where quality peaks out and then it starts to deteriorate after that. Uh, it makes sense from a factory perspective that if you want to produce 125,000 tons of sugar, you'd rather do it with 700 ton of 700,000 ton of beef rather than 800,000 ton of beef. But I, I, we get both sides, and so we work with the growers to try and approve varieties that also produce high uh, sugar per acre. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, it's better for our, our older factories to, to process fewer tons and get just the same amount of sugar. So we like to focus on on quality which is an important part of our research program. Our, and I maybe should mention too, in Alberta we, have, we produce the highest quality beets in North America. The, we have cooler nights here. Our growers are fantastic at hitting that, the proper fertility um, program and everything they do in between from seed bed prep to har harvest timing and everything like that and timing of weed control. That we produce, uh, you know, we have the highest quality beets in, in, in uh, North America. And it's because of things like this in our rotation that uh, we get that. And then here's root yield. I talked about how root yield is driven by high, it is driven by nitrogen. So root yield along the vertical axis, and then you've got your um, your treatment, your, your nitrogen treatments there, and we're really pushing yield there up to 34 ton. So we see that where uh, where yield is really driven by by nitrogen. So I just kind of wanted to use that as a backdrop, some basic fertility stuff for sugar beet. We know that we can drive yield with, with, uh, with nitrogen, but quality goes in the toilet, and that's kind of something that we um, you maybe just keep in your mind as we do, as we do some of this, or, or as we go through some of these, through these slides. So I'm going to talk about uh, three projects that we're doing. If, I, if we would have been at the, the plots Atlantic, when Jamie asked me to do this, I thought of these. These are kind of higher, higher um, level projects that we're doing. And as I mentioned, they're built upon all the projects that have, have come before. And so this is kind of where we're at with the nitrogen program with Roger Sugar in our research program. We're testing, we're, we're manipulating plant population to see how that affects um, quality based on different nitrogen rates. So we'll talk about that one. We have results on that one, but I, you know, I'll talk about maybe some results and conclusions, but no data on that today. And then a harvest date by nitrogen rate test. How does harvest date affect plots with different nitrogen rates? And then uh, nitrogen reduction in sugar beet. So this is kind of our, you know, we ended our discussion out in the field by talking about that 30% reduction in emissions. So I'll just touch on this. We haven't done any, re um, so this is the first year of testing for this project. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about this one and why we're doing that and kind of show you a treatment list to see the complexity of kind of what we're doing with that project. Okay, plant population by nitrogen test. 
So I always like to ask a question and then hopefully we'll provide an answer for you to this uh, question by the end of this section on this project. Can the potentially negative quality effects of excessive soil nitrogen levels be mitigated by manipulating stand establishment? So to, to test this, we developed, we developed a, an experiment with nine treatments. Factor one was 100, 150, and 200 plants per 100 foot of row, mixed in with uh, factor two at zero, 100, and 200 pounds of nitrogen added. Um, so yeah, the, the objective was to evaluate the different plant populations with free nitrogen regimens in one commercially approved variety. Um, so what we did was we planted the plots really heavy and then thinned them by hand. I went in and used a, a hoe and then we measure, so yeah, to thin them back to get them to the desired population. And then we measure root yield and quality at time of harvest to get the data and see how things work. So I took these within the last day or two, um, just to kind of show, like this is what you would have seen today if we were out in the field. I apologize if we're not there. Um, you can see a little bit from these where, uh, yeah, you can see the lower plant population. So this is at zero pounds of N. Uh, you can see a little bit more soil uh, exposure there. And I took, have, has anybody used Canopio or Canop, or what, what's yeah, that Canop, what is it? Canopio. Yeah, Canopio. So I took pictures of these and I was going to put them in here, but I thought, ah. but you can, um, you can definitely tell with the 200 plants, there's, there's more coverage there intercepting sunlight and less soil exposure. So I just wanted to kind of show that. And then at the 100 pound rate, same, uh, 100, 150, and 200 plants per 100 foot. So this is kind of like, this would kind of be like our ideal treatment really. You can see it's quite, there's a little bit of, you know, there's some gaps and things and this is a little bit more of a robust kind of system. This is maybe a little bit heavy. I don't think there's many guys out there wanting 200 plants per 100 foot of row, hey Arnie? Most guys are, we did multiple years of testing on plant population and what the optimal level is and in two years we found 150, 150 plants per 100 foot and in the other two years, I think we did, we, we did probably four or five years of testing, but off the top, I know that two years was 150 and uh, two years was 175. Plants per 100 foot is kind of like the optimal range for the for best quality and yield. So that's kind of the ideal in there with that 100 pounds. And we know as researchers, we like to push the limits. So 200 pounds, you can see, we're, we're seeing something this year, I don't know that we've seen it before, but the 200 pound, I talked about driving uh, canopy growth and root yield with, with nitrogen. It looks like there is maybe a little bit of uh, lag in some of these plots uh, at the 200 pound rate, like if I go back to the 100. I think that 100 looks better. You'd think that there'd be more top growth there. But uh, anyway, this one just looks not great at all, right? But, um, so yeah, definitely you can see the, the, higher, the higher plant populations, you have more coverage but that 200 pound rate this year, I might have to go back and look through all reps and just see if we're seeing that across. Um, anyway, the 200 pound rate doesn't look great. And this was all, you know, I didn't, know, didn't explain the methods very good, but this was all applied in fall, the, our, our nitrogen rates. So nowhere near close to planting. Uh, as I mentioned, the 150 is kind of our optimal, so I wanted to just kind of quickly show the 0, 100, and 200 pound rates. And again, you can definitely see a difference there. Well, in, in my mind, I can, yeah, you can see the difference between those two, but some lag there in the 200 pound. I would have expected this one to be to have a little more fuller canopy and better looking, but that ah, doesn't doesn't look great. But I think definitely a step up from zero to 100. So, so that's what the field looks like right now. Obviously, we don't have results from 2013, so I'll maybe just explain quickly some of the results in 2020 and what we found. This was all published in our annual research report. So if you're interested in this, reach out to me. Um, I can send you that research report. It'll put you to sleep without fail. Like it's 165 pages of sugar beet research. That's, anyway. I go through it and read. There's a few people that read it, but um, it's, a, it's kind of like the yeah, it's, it's nice to accomplish that at the end of the year. There's a good feeling that comes when you summarize all that, but it's a big report. 
Okay, so what we found from the 2020 results that um, negative quality effects, so if you think back to our question, I maybe should have posted it, but can we, or yeah, posted it on this slide, but can we, can we, min, um, can we mit mitigate the negative effects of excess nitrogen by manipulating uh, plant populations? So to answer that question, negative quality effects of excessive nitrogen, so that, that 200 pound per acre rate, when sugar beet stand is low, can be partially mitigated by higher plant populations. So yeah, we're finding that if you have a higher plant population where, you know, sometimes you go into a field, you rent, you're renting land, or um, maybe you had to switch fields or something, but there's, without fail, every, every year we find fields that are going into sugar beet that have like three or 400 pounds of nitrogen in the soil, way too much. So we're finding, based on the results of this test, is that, um, you probably wouldn't want to plant 200 or have 200 plants come up, but if you could target a higher plant population, and if everything goes well with through the spring, and you can get that high population, um, you'll definitely uh, you'll definitely be able to help your quality if you um, if you have excessive nitrogen on on, the, on certain fields. Is what we're finding. So when nitrogen rates were reduced down to zero, quality was improved where low plant populations were lower. So if you think of a situation, well, why would you have low nitrogen? Well, I talked about holding back a little bit, and the reason you would hold back a little bit is maybe you're not too sure on that variety or how it might um, perform, or sometimes what happens is you get, like, freeze in the fall, or sorry, in the spring after emergence, where you get wind, and your population gets knocked way back, and then it doesn't, um, they're not, population or, or stand isn't knocked back enough to warrant a replant and so you're stuck with a crummy stand and so um, if you if you have crummy stand and you've got all your nitrogen up front then you're really going to affect quality so you want to try and maybe hold back on a little bit of that nitrogen just based on or just to find out maybe what happens in spring and how your emergence is and if it's good then you can top up if it's bad and you can't replant then um, having lower nitrogen uh, in the soil is going to benefit you based on what we found in 2022. And then root yield, when 100 or 200 pounds of uh, N was added per acre, root yield increased for the 100 and 150 plant per hundred foot treatments compared to when no nitrogen fertilizer was added. And that we, we know that, uh, that those excessive nitrogen rates will push yield and findings also indicated that excessive plant populations up to 200 plants may reduce root yield potential so lots of tinier beets um, don't produce as much root yield per acre and we kind of already do that as well so conclusions manipulating plant population in sugar beet can help mitigate potential reduction in quality or extract so when i say quality yeah it's extractable sugar per ton so where you have excessive nitrogen in the field, you want higher populations. Where you have a low population, so you lost some stand in the spring, you might want to hold back on nitrogen applications earlier on. So just kind of be thinking about that. And then excessive nitrogen can generally affect extractable sugar per ton. So the second test, how many? So, I've just got a couple more minutes here and then we'll, we'll wrap up. But harvest date by nitrogen rate test, the second test that I'll talk about today. So kind of in the same vein as the plant population test, can harvest date be used to manipulate the potentially negative quality effects of deficient or excessive soil nitrogen levels? So if I have a field that has way too much nitrogen, should I harvest that field first or should I harvest it later? And hopefully we'll be able to answer that question for you. So in, um, maybe just to explain up front, in 2022, we had two harvest dates, September 1st and October 3rd, and we used um, three nitrogen rates. Zero, which was a deficient level, 100 pounds, which was a uh, recommended, and uh, the 200 pound rate, which was the excessive rate. So that's 2022, and I'll explain the results of that test, but uh, what you would have seen today in the field was 12 treatments. So we've ramped this up a little bit. So factor one was actually four. So 2022 was two harvest dates. 2023, we're pumping up, we're doing three, or sorry, four harvest dates. 
and then with the same, we'll actually change our rates a little bit. But 0, 1, 25, Peter always likes to change the rates. I'm like, just keep the same so we can combine all the years. But no, if it's, he knows what he's doing, but yeah, for me and my research mind, I like to have three or four years of the same treatments, and then we can combine them all. But uh, that, this tells a different story. And that's the nice thing about our research program, is that if we want to kind of change gears or change things a little bit, we have the flexibility to do that with the, with the grower committee. Uh, and we can kind of change, we're not locked into some um, proposal, we can kind of change things a little bit. So, so the, the rates are a little bit different, but 0, 125, and 250 for this year. So that's what you would have seen in the field today. Uh, so I'll just explain the results of the 2022, which was two harvest dates and three, the three different nitrogen rates. So the latest harvest date, and this kind of stuff intrigues me, we did some hail simulation work, um, and if, you know, if, a ha if a field gets hailed, versus one that doesn't get hailed, if a grower has two fields, which one should he harvest first? And so if you have a field of low nitrogen because you had poor stand and you didn't top up, or if you have excessive, a field with excessive nitrogen um, with good stand, like which one should you harvest first? So this is kind of some interesting work. So the latest harvest date produced higher root yield and quality when equivalent nitrogen rates were compared, which makes sense. You leave it in longer, it's gonna drive yield and, and quality. So another thing we found, uh, so we compared, I actually like to do this to compare daily and weekly gains during the harvest period, so between September 1st and October 3rd, and we'll do that in 2023 comparing four harvest dates. I like to see the growth, and actually growers will often ask that, like how much sugar is being produced per day in August or in September, and we can, you know, doing projects like this, we can tell them. It's kind of a neat number to have. So they were compared um, and then calculated. So roots tended to bulk faster and produce more extractable sugar per acre when deficient and recommended nitrogen rates were applied, which is kind of counterintuitive. Uh, and then EST and percent sugar accumulated quicker for the excessive nitrogen rate treatments. Though I should men mention that, um, uh, I think I have maybe in the next slide. Oh, sorry, I didn't put that up. Anyway, so there's that. So relative to each other though, overall quality, so EST and percent sugar were lower overall where nitrogen rates were excessive, and root yield and ESA were higher overall where nitrogen rates were excessive. So we're still holding true to our sort of like our, um, our base knowledge that, that uh, nitrogen is gonna improve yield and affect quality, but it's funny to me that um, these daily gains were different during that harvest period. They were faster for, for um, the excess, for ESA and root yield for excessive uh, nitrogen rates. And then quality was, was quicker for the, um, yeah, sorry, what have I got? Really quicker for the excessive nitrogen rate treatment. So yeah, that EST is normally gonna go down with excessive nitrogen rate, but it's accumulating faster during that growing period. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, assuming we have a warmer spring. Yeah. The sugar beets are bigger this year. Yeah, they're about a week or 10 days ahead, I think. Okay, so hopefully our tons are bigger this year. Yeah. Should I, should I juice my uh, nitrogen up 15 tons? No, it's, we've, we've found, we feel like the, the, the varieties have, so we test the varieties for three years, and we feel like we're pretty solid on our understanding of um, what these varieties are gonna produce. Um, so, and our, our, um, our varieties are grown under optimal soil, uh, soil nitrogen levels and fertility levels. So, I feel like, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend going over. I just wouldn't because we know that overall, and I'm thinking of Peter standing here beside me, he wouldn't recommend going higher. He would say that we know that that, so that's why we have the 180 to 220 range. That 220 is like your max. Um, so, you, you know, if, if you're thinking you want to push it up, then you maybe could up to the 220, but I just feel like, yeah, you're going to affect your bottom line. Um, if you, do you know what's in your soil and what you've already applied, and you're saying going over the 220, or, or well, what? You're just hypothetical? Push the envelope a little bit. Yeah. Ah. I think that's probably maybe where we're going with some of these varieties, but we 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 revisited this 120 to 2 uh, sorry 180 to 220 recently, and we're sticking to that. It's, so I would I wouldn't go out and recommend that to a grower. I just wouldn't. Um, 
if you think as an agronomist you want to try and convince your grower to do that, then if he bites on that, then, but, I don't know, I just, like our, our beet king last year did 40 ton, basically, like 39, I don't remember what it was, or any, but it was just under 40 ton. And those guys aren't pushing 250, like, they're not pushing up to 250. And so, I mean, you could push yield with that, but at the end of the day, you're still affecting, you're still affecting quality. Like, our optimal level for best quality is within that range, and so, um, and I have no vested interest in this, like, monetarily, like, we're not selling for, like, I have no conflict of interest. I'm, I want our growers to produce the best quality and sugar freighter that they possibly can, and so it's, yeah, I just, personally, I just wouldn't, but I understand what you're saying, it's a good question, and we've revisited that, with that idea in mind, like, oh, should we do that, but they're still holding pretty, pretty firm on that, or we, we would. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, conclusion on that project. For a better extractable sugar per, uh, per ton outcome, harvest fields with optimal soil end levels first and leave ex excess fields until later because of that quicker uh, accumulation uh, that we're observing later in the season. And this is based on uh, only one year of data, right? So I'm not going to, but um, it's, it, it's interesting that we're finding that. And it'll be interesting to see what happens this year. Uh, sugar beets do kind of weird things like that with um, yeah, late season where there's you know, things you might not expect. And that holds true year after year. Like with the growth rate study that I did, our high tonnage variety was was way better on quality early on. And our high quality our high quality variety was slower on quality early on. But then it, they, they changed hands and it, so it was something I didn't expect at all. But, and that was repeated three or four out of four years where that higher tonnage variety was excelling in quality early on, but then decelerated and then the high quality variety surpassed it later and, uh, and later into the growing season. So it's kind of neat. So for better extractable sugar per acre outcome, outcome uh, uh, better extractable sugar per acre outcome, harvest fields with optimal soil end levels last and harvest excess fields first. Okay, nitrogen reduction in sugar beet. This is my last, uh, I've got just a couple slides. So the Canadian government, we talked about this, has recently targeted a 30% reduction in nitrogen-based fertilizer emissions. Maybe, I, I don't know if I have that right, um, by 2030. Anyway, it, uh, it um, initiated conversations between the company and the growers, and we thought, um, we've done a little bit of work on this in the past, but this is specific to respond kind of to that, that question or that, uh, that proposal. Is that for sure by 2030? Is that just a proposal? Does anybody know? Like, is it something they're still kind of working on, or who knows? Does anybody know? I don't, I don't know. That's so. This is maybe a. It's this currently is, a voluntary target. Yeah, this is maybe a knee-jerk thing, but we want to kind of be ready. Um, yeah, if, if it comes up, have some data to present. Trials from 2015 to 2018 showed a 2.7 percent average reduction from a maximum extractable sugar per acre with a 30% reduction in application rate. So we're not seeing that. So proportionately, you're only seeing a 2.5% decrease with a 30% decrease. So um, that work has kind of been done, but this is more, yeah, we're targeting. I, I, that, that project wasn't specifically looking at that. I think uh, Peter interpolated uh, the data to sort of come up with that number, but we're doing a specific project on that this year. These tests showed that the first 50 pounds of N applied had a, had a larger effect on increasing ESA than the last 50 pounds. So you're getting more bang for your buck on uh, extractable sugar per acre with that first 50 pounds. And we kind of saw that from my slides, right? You're getting to that optimal level at the 50, 75 pound per acre rate. Just to explain this test a little bit more, I already said that this is our response to that threat. The objective is to assess sugar beet response to optimum and reduced fertilizer rates at soil plus supply, of course. And it's noted that the government mandate is targeting nitrogen-based fertilizer emission reduction and not fertilizer reduction. That's kind of our interpretation of that, but just to be clear on that, that we're, um, and I don't know, we might have to employ some of the, some of the, the measuring techniques on um, nitrogen emissions in this project. I don't know where that's going to go, but it might be worth considering. So we got uh, 
with with the uh, untreated check ten treatments. Um, it's kind of a this is my my, my um, busy slide, my, my busiest slide of all the slides. But anyway, I just wanted to kind of show. So we're considering fall urea and fall ESN and then spring ESN. So three of each with uh, the recommended minus 30, minus 60. And we'll see what happens. It's a, it's kind of a neat project. We'll, um, yeah, just stay tuned. Maybe if you're interested on that, we'll do, be doing a write-up on that in, in October. So I don't like to present projects that we don't have data or results on, but this is this is my crack at it anyway. But we're doing that this year and if I would have we would have had you at our plots today, I would have talked about this um, this experiment. And something uh, so I've got my last slide is just the question slide, but um, you know talking about cover crops with all of this, the question came up, well okay, so we broadcast applied um, wheat, I believe, so spring wheat and then a barley um, treatment in sugar beet last year and then this year and then we took it out at different times with diff so different planting rates different uh, times of removal and different herbicides to remove and the question came up well how is that affecting fertility like taking keeping in mind all of the stuff we're talking about yield and quality putting a cover crop in there and leaving it longer is obviously going to take some of your nitrogen out of the top few inches of soil it's going to be competing with the with the crop so is there a place for testing cover crops with uh, fertility or fertility management? So that's another project we're doing this year. We're doing different, uh, so we, we're set on our rate for the cover crop, like how much we're planting or put down. And I think we did two different crops, but we're doing different nitrogen rates as well. So that's another kind of neat project that we're running this year. Just to kind of, I thought I'd maybe bring that in just because we're talking about cover crops today. So in the sugar beet world, Growers are using cover crops, but how is that affecting their fertility? And maybe it's something that we should be thinking about. So in those situations, maybe you would think about adding just a little bit more, because you know that the cover crops are going to be competing for it. Yo, when are you broadcasting in the spring, sir? Say that again. When are we? Up, when are we broadcasting? And in the spring? No, no, no. The cover crop. Oh, so we did that um, the day before planting. Oh. So we, uh, yeah. So we broadcast with a hand spreader. Then we went over it with a time harrow, and then we planted into it like within a day or two. So that's like a, I call that a nurse crop. Basically. Nurse crop. Because you're trying to kill. You're going to so, kill it. You're gonna yeah, we're going to kill it. Yeah. It's basically there just for wind protection. So this is good to know because uh, Peter actually got some flax for covering, calling it because he was calling it a nurse crop for the longest time, and everyone was like, it's not a nurse crop. It's a cover crop. So we change the thing. So you're calling well, it a nurse crop. Maybe, maybe that fits better with what other people call it or, or okay. it with. So what's a cover crop then? You're saying it's beforehand or? Yeah, or I, I kind of consider more after it. Or I guess it's a nurse crop because it's just there to help the. Nurse it up. I guess, it, I, guess, I guess it's a nurse crop because it's more for the crop, not for the soil. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so ours is mainly for the. For the for the for protection erosion, wind erosion for the little beets yeah for wind erosion and for guys watching their land blow and it destroys the beets and their land flies so you can call it a cover crop yourself but we can fight about definitions later yeah we've done that already <laughs> and I want the arm wrestle believe it or not I think a nurse for me a nurse crop is like when you're establishing alfalfa so okay. when you grow the room with alfalfa that's the nurse crop to you yeah no, that's true yeah okay any attempt at trying to get cover after you harvest. So actually, we're, we're working on that right now. Um, not applying anything. That's an interesting question because it's got to be pragmatic. Is that the right word? Like it's got to be a. Uh, we gotta. We have to do something that growers are actually gonna do. And so with everything else going on, are they gonna go and broadcast something on there? Because most guys, after they harvest their beets, they're gonna deep rip. Like I, yeah, and and turn the tops in and have it looking nice for. And, and actually beet tops, believe it or not, and that whole system actually hold quite well yeah. um, over, the, over the fall and into the winter. So to convince a guy to go in there and broadcast something and then maybe either work it in or irrigate it after. So, um, so there's that. There's that. Yep. Why don't they just leave the beet top? Well, for erosion. And for erosion. Take yes. care of it in the next spring. Some do. Yeah, some do. Because yeah. then they control the erosion over the winter. Yeah. Well, there's growers. There's the growers in the room. Why is it because of a, is it appearance or is it? Did you hear? Raising your hand? No. no. Um, 
Mainly because when it, after harvest you've got a layer of topsoil over the top of the top and yeah. then the foliage. Okay. So those will start uh, the growing if you leave that through. The gotcha. Yeah. So, so there's that consideration, but uh, Farming Smart was out at our plots yesterday planting an inter row crop um, right before row closure after our last glyphosate application. So we've applied glyphosate. Uh, as many times as we're going to this year on that site, and there's enough soil exposure that we're able to get a planter in there, a monosome planter, and so we've, we, um, Lewis and, and uh, Carlo, is it, were out there yesterday, and they planted in between some of our plot uh, rows within our plots, and we irrigated it yesterday, and so we're gonna, there's six different crops, so we're gonna see if that comes up, and then how harvest operations affect that. And I think that might be maybe something that growers might bite on if they're really concerned about the erosion in the fall. Or, or you, like you said, after harvest, broadcast apply and then fertilize. But yeah, you know, got to do something that growers are going to want to do. That's, that's, um, do you remember what species they tried? So there's winter wheat, winter pea, winter lentil, uh, sorghum savan grass, fall rye, one other. Maybe it's corn. Corn, that's it. And you know, maybe like round or fritted corn might be okay. You plant it earlier even, and then you, then you don't worry about killing it. Uh, but then you got that growing between your beets all year. <laughs> so I don't know. Anyway, it's just, it's just kind of proof of con concept to see if we can establish something in beet and then how harvest affects it. And I think this is a good system because it's actually coming up between the rows and our pinch wheel, or like our digger wheel is only gonna, you know, harvest or sort of um, disturb five to six inches, really, or maybe maybe more than that, maybe like more like eight. Uh, so you got 22 inches between rows and beads. So yeah, yeah hopefully it'll stay. Yep. Run with ready kosher. Yeah, that's a good question about, so what's your, so. Some growers are using it. Yeah, I know they are. <laughs> Yeah. So that's a good question. I, um, it's Life tricky for us. Technology and selling. Yeah. So it's tricky for us because our we try and keep our beet fields clean of that, and so it's um, in my research mind I would say, well, well, let's go plant some Roundup or sorry, some glyphosate resistant kochia, and then test different things. But my understanding is that you guys have a little bit out here, Ken, or no? Just maybe, a little. Maybe in the future I was gonna <laughs> maybe see if I can chat with Lewis and see maybe we could put some plots here and just try different because we could. Maybe come and plant rows and then uh, plant plots and then see, just try different. My background is in weed ecology and like weed management, so kind of, uh, and maybe with um, Charles Geddes here too. I don't know if he might have some input on it, but that was kind of his focus is GR Kosha, I think, in, in uh, Rana Pretty Canola. I think his PhD was in that. I might be mistaken on that, but um, yeah, just to try and see if there's different things that we can do to manage it in Sherby because even in our outlier sites, like we have our Tabor site where we're, we're planting plots, but we have our official variety trials with grower cooperators, and we try and control the weeds as much as we possibly can, but I'm seeing GR kosher in all of those fields, so it's, it's coming. It's not, there's not lots of it, but I mean, out of 10, you might see one escape or something, or two escapes. But there are also be all over that. Yeah, so I think we need to, and, if, and so our trouble is finding a site, and I know that there are growers that have it in their fields, but it's trickier to do plot work or even field scale stuff in a grower's field just with timing and, and everything else that's going on, it's trickier, but if we could get a site and maybe look at that, then I think we could maybe, yeah, with, with what the Americans have learned with all their GR weeds, like they've got a pile down there, so, but they have, Roundup ready beans, Roundup ready uh, corn, Roundup ready sugar beets, and then that's their rotation. So they've kind of cotton. cotton. Yeah, cotton, like it's just a mess. But yeah, I, it's on my radar, and it's definitely something that uh, we need to look at and start thinking about. And I saw the kosher here, and I thought, oh, great. You saw it? Anyway, any other questions? Oh, my Jay, I thought it was interesting that you guys responded so quickly to uh, a policy in, in nitrogen, nitrous oxide reduction. Yeah. Um, in, in some regards, like are there other approaches 
you think that you could employ that might also minimize nitrogen reductions? Like, yeah. in, 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 well, crops, like, you know, broadcasting and incorporating as, as an example is one practice that could probably be improved on. Why, yeah. why jump straight to just reducing yeah. nitrogen? And yeah. then maybe it's also a question for Ben, because I think, yeah, we might be able to reduce nitrogen, um, but is reducing nitrogen by, say, 25%? Going to result in 25% reduction in the emissions. The emissions, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, it was driven a little bit by our research committee that it was coming, and we just didn't want to. Um, I think it's just a kind of a progressive industry that, yeah, we want to kind of be. You know, it's good and bad. You can have, you know, you might have that data and show that there's no effect, so we should reduce it anyways. So there's, you might be shooting yourself in the foot that, that way, but. Um, maybe just being proactive a little bit that way. That's why I asked about the policy, like is it even a thing? No, but, it's not. No, it's not. Um, so I think that's a little bit. As far as other ideas, um, yeah, I'm not too sure. I, I hadn't even thought, but yeah, you're, you're a thinker, Ken, so, but you talked about put, like, put, putting, yeah, <laughs> putting, putting pulse into the rotation, like, and then like as a whole, you're kind of reducing it on farm, really, right? So, I don't know, maybe, I hadn't even thought about that, but yeah. I was a little interested in the first slides. You had ESN everywhere, and I thought that's the worst form of nitrogen. Yeah. If you want to you use yeah. it up to maintain your quality. So I was a little bit curious about that, and I mm -hmm. thought, well, maybe it's because they're putting on in the fall, which I would way rather put yeah. available and on in the spring. So it's in the spring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's it's that's a discussion that maybe we can have. Like, it's, I kind of came, I'm not going to, I don't want to throw anyone under the bus. I kind of came into it when they were using that, though, as a, to safen um, nitrogen in spring. Because we found that you could apply large amounts of ESN in spring close to planting, and it didn't, it drastically reduced, drastically it'll, reduced. It'll reduce that, but all that nitrogen will come available later, right when you want the leaks to be later. winding down. Yes. <laughs> it's yes. going to be too and late. Actually, and actually, to, add to something interesting, we found is for for whatever reason they were we were using ESN in fall, and and the, it was a perfect storm of conditions that all that there was a whole bunch of nitrogen available, and uh, maybe being converted or whatever in spring right at time of planting, and it just it just completely nuked our plots. So that was ESN planted in fall, like you wouldn't kind of maybe expect that or. And then so in spring, it was like, I don't, and I don't know why we did that, but it was just something that we stumbled onto and found that there was a significant reduction in stand in all those high uh, ESN plots. Yeah. So that's good logic. Um, yeah. But maybe something to think about and avoid in the future for us. Go ahead. Some of, some of the growers are, are doing split applications. Yes. So we'll do, yeah. Oh, actually, that's our, right. Our rule of thumb is 50-50. You have to put a bunch on, we'll put a, a third of it in ESN. And then two thirds in the in forty yeah. seconds. Yeah. Yeah, that's another approach we've used. Any other questions? Thanks for sticking around to the end of the day. I know I know it's not I know it's Catherine left. Yeah, uh, she she just didn't have the energy to make fun of you. <laughs> she had to be out to seven persons later. Yeah. No, she did apologize for leaving Jay. She she stuck mm -hmm. around because of you. Yeah, I know. She Anyways, did. thank you so much, Jay, and maybe yeah. join me in thanking him for <laughs>